Well, today's message might be a little bit different than normal. I want to build theology, which I do that all the time. Building theology is not unusual for me, but I want to punch the devil in the face today. Me too. <laughs> all right, I'm glad you're on board with me because I'm going to need your help and support and prayer because he's going to want to punch me back, okay? So I need you all carrying me along in prayer. Last week, we started looking at ways that the enemy can scheme against us, right? Mm -hmm. You can call it spiritual warfare. You can call it just sneaky attacks of the enemy, whatever you want to call it. But we started kind of looking at that last week. And I want to continue to do that today, but a little bit more um, in the face of the devil, so to speak. Last week, we started with 2 Corinthians 2.11. Stephen, pop that one up for me. I kind of, as I explained last week, I kind of took it out of context a little bit to get this last phrase. In order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Right? So, we must make ourselves aware of what those schemes are so that we can victoriously overcome them in Jesus. After all, this is about Jesus and not the enemy, right? See, what Paul is saying, he's making an, an emphatic statement. We're not unaware of what the devil is up to. Now, the context was here that there was unforgiveness happening in the Corinthian church, and it was starting to split and divide the church. And Paul's like, look, we know what's going on. We know the devil is in this unforgiveness. We're not unaware of what he's up to. And so I just love that idea, and I want to pick up on that of, let's not be unaware of what the devil is up to, okay? And, and here's the thing. This week, it was on Thursday, I saw a new Gallup poll that came out. And it said that belief in the devil among Christians is the lowest it's ever been. Guess what? The devil's winning. We have become unaware of his schemes to the point where we don't even believe he exists anymore. And again, this is a message about Jesus, right? Jesus gives us the victory, but we have to understand that we do have an enemy and that he is fighting against us, right? But if the majority of Christians no longer believe in the devil, it's no wonder that the devil is having a field day because we've no longer made ourselves aware of his schemes. And just continuing along with this idea of setting the stage, Stephen, go to John 10, 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. When the devil is operating, there's all kinds of chaos and pandemonium going on in our life. Stealing, killing, destroying, right? But when Jesus is in our life, we've got peace and peace abundantly. This is a litmus test for your life. What's going on in your life? This tells you who's winning in your life, right? And then uh, 1 Peter 5, 8, Stephen. Be self-controlled and alert. This version says sober. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He doesn't exactly have our best interests at heart now, does he? The enemy has our destruction in mind with all of his attacks. But of course, he doesn't show up on our door and announce himself and say that he's here to destroy us. Because that would make it a lot easier, right? No, his attacks can be very subtle and at oftentimes very slow and deliberate, like reaching the point where as a whole faith movement, we no longer believe in him. Oftentimes, we can't sense or see the attacks until there are already consequences. And I'm going to make that point further today from, from Genesis. It's kind of like the frog in the kettle. You know, if you put a frog in the kettle and you turn on the heat and you slowly turn it up, the frog will never jump out. That's kind of what the devil does to us. That's why it's important to make ourselves aware of his schemes. Last week, I started with prayer. How does the enemy attack our prayer? And I looked at a very extreme example from Daniel 10, where Daniel was crying out to the Lord, and the Lord immediately dispatched an angel to go to Daniel and answer the prayer. But that angel was detained for 21 days by the king of Persia that was a demonic spirit. And so we saw that the, Satan has designated a demonic spirit, a very powerful demonic spirit, just to torment the king of Persia. And it took Michael, the archangel, to overcome that demonic spirit. So it was a very powerful spirit. Then last week, we also looked at 2 Corinthians, that passage where he says we're not unaware of his schemes, where he talked about the lack of forgiveness, and that was dividing the Corinthian church. And we also looked last week at how the devil can attack us through our emotions from Ephesians 4. Today, I want to continue looking at the way the enemies can attack us. And I'll do that from Genesis 
But before we get there, I want to point out something else real quick. In his book, Wild at Heart, you remember years ago, John Eldridge wrote a book called Wild at Heart? Um, yeah. It was a very popular book a, a number of years ago. In this book, he points out three stages of the way the enemy attacks us. And I think these three stages are really important. So I'm going to just briefly mention them here, and then we'll jump into Genesis. Stage one, I'm not really here. This is what I talked about with the frog in the kettle. The enemy's tactics can be so subtle that at first we don't even realize that he's attacking us. So stage one, I'm not really here. Stage two, intimidation. When, he, when we begin to question him to resist his lies, again, I'm quoting from John Eldridge here. When we begin to resist him and question his lies, to see his hand in the ordinary trials of our life, then he steps up the attacks and he turns to intimidation and fear. Right? We've all experienced that. And then stage three, the most dangerous one, cutting a deal. After a round or two of intimidation, Satan offers us a deal. He'll suggest to you through thoughts, feelings, emotions, sometimes the words of other people, that your life would be easier if you just backed off. Yeah. Oh, I've experienced that plenty of times. You preach a message that punches the devil in the face, and all next week you're like, I'm not doing any good, I should just quit. Mm -hmm. But the devil will come to you and offer all these examples well, you should stop talking to that person because, you know. Or the devil will convince you to cocoon, to pull inside of yourself, to protect yourself and isolate yourself from everything else. Or even worse, the devil will convince you to harm others or to harm yourself as a way to get the attacks to stop. Amy and I experienced this once. We were doing ministry down in Hyde Park, Chicago. And there was this woman who had been sexually abused and never gotten any treatment for that, never gotten any help. And so she was tormented from this sexual abuse. And so the devil came to her one day and said, well, go and do to that little girl what was done to you and it'll stop. And so she did. She went and she abused another little girl. And then, of course, the torment doubled. By the time we got to that poor girl was so demonized, she was probably the worst demonized person I've ever seen. But as you're looking at some areas in your life right now, where is their struggle? What stage are you in? Are you in the, I'm not here are you in the intimidation, or are you in the, oh gosh, I think I want to cut a deal with the devil? Today I want to look at how he attacks personal identity, gender, and authority, all to get at marriage. I want to make a very emphatic point right here. As we look around the world and the culture and the society that we live in, a lot of the junk that as Christians we really don't like, it's all an attack of the devil on marriage. It's not political. I'm going to make that point very clear in a little bit. It's not a political thing. The devil is attacking marriage. Marriage is sacred, and so the enemy wants to attack it. The very first thing that we see the enemy attack in Scripture is identity and marriage back in Genesis. It's his oldest trick. It's the oldest trick in the book, as they say. But it can go in many different ways. Well, of course, why? Because marriage is covenant, and it represents the covenant with God. If Satan can destroy marriage, he can destroy our best representation of covenant with God, and he can destroy humanity. If Satan can take out marriage, he can take out all of humanity and the image of God. Right? And I'll show that to you in Genesis, I promise. So let's start working through Genesis. Let's start in Genesis 126 and work our way all the way to chapter 3. With any luck, we'll be done before lunch. <laughs> then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over livestock and over all the wild animals and over all of the creation that moves along the ground. So God creates mankind in his image. We also see the Trinity in here. Do you see the Trinity? Let us make Mankind in our image. It's referring to the Trinity. That's a plural pronoun. God doesn't have split personality. It's referring to the Trinity. Mankind gets the image of God the animals do not. All of us, every race, every people get the image of God. This is really important as it relates to our personal identity. Part of my personal identity is that I am created in the image of God. 
which means I was made perfectly as he intended. I am not perfect. I am perfectly as he intended. Let that sink in for a minute in the culture and the world that we see around us right now. I am made perfectly as God intended. There would be no need for me to try to change who I am. The next thing God does is to give man authority to rule over every living creature on earth and even the earth itself. The animals didn't get this either. In fact, they are subject to it. Part of our identity is that we bear the image of God and we have authority to rule over the earth. This is what the enemy loves to attack. Because our authority also extends over Satan, so he will attack our authority, so we lose our defense against him. Do you see that? Genesis 128, Stephen. God blessed them, them being us humanity, and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. What's really important to see here is the promises of God for mankind. Mankind gets the blessing of God. God blessed them. The animals didn't get that. So again, this is a huge part of our personal identity. I am blessed. Cash, you are blessed by God. It's part of your identity. Mark, you're blessed by God. It's, it's innate. It's in you. God put that blessing in you as part of how he created you. Then the blessings of being fruitful come into this passage. The ability to be fruitful and multiply comes from the fact that we have received his blessings. There's a big misunderstanding here, and I'm going to step on toes, and that's all right. It says, be fruitful and increase in number. That was a poor translation from the King James Version many, many years ago. And what's interesting is you study the history of biblical translation. If the King James did it, even if it was wrong, all other translations are hesitant to move away from it. One of my seminary professors, when I was in seminary, explained the Hebrew to us in this passage. It's a result clause. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. The way my seminary professor helped us understand this is it's a result clause. Because you are blessed, you will be fruitful and multiply. So because God's blessings are on us, that allows us to be fruitful and multiply. So the ability to be fruitful and multiply is contained in the image and the blessing that God gave us. Yeah. Do you think the devil might want to attack that? Too often, Christianity turned us into a totalitarian demand. Have more babies, have more babies, have more babies. No, no, no. Our ability to have babies is contained in the fact that we're blessed from God. This isn't something I have to go do. And then as a result of the blessing and the fruitfulness... With mankind, we will fill the earth and subdue it. And then we see authority repeated. It says, rule over the fish, the sea, and the birds, and the air, and every living creature. Now, this is not two separate accounts. A minute ago, it gave us authority, and then it gave us authority again here. This is important to, rep to understand. It's not separate accounts. When modern-day people try to read Genesis, we try to read it like a scientific textbook. And they think that they see two different creation accounts. It's all the same thing. And they try to say, well, that's not scientifically possible. The book of Hebrew, the book of Genesis is not a textbook. It's Hebrew poetry. And there are certain rules and laws that apply to poetry. Pentameter matters more than scientific fact or accuracy. Rhyme and rhythm, well, rhythm would be pentameter, they matter more than the scientific facts. So in, in poetry, it'll say something with a certain rhythm, and then it'll say it again in a different rhythm to emphasize what it already said. That's poetry. And so twice in here, it says that we have authority to rule, and it does that not as two separate accounts, but to emphasize, to use a meta narrative, as it were, to really drive home the fact that we have authority and rule. Is that clear as mud? 
All right. <clears throat> I'm doing a great job. <laughs> now, the word rule here that's used in both places means to rule, to have dominion, to subjugate. In other words, authority. So we see being blessed, being fruitful, and authority. Satan loves to come and attack these things and convince us that we're not blessed and that we don't have authority. Let's go to Genesis 2-7, Stephen. <clears throat> The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Men are made from dust. Sorry, ladies, that's why we're always a little messy. <laughs> and when you look under your bed and there's a bunch of dust bunnies down there, that's someone either coming or going, right? <laughs> Here's what I think is interesting, if you let me geek out on this for a minute. The Hebrew word for man, Adam, Sound is like and is related to the Hebrew word for ground, Adama. So God took some Adama, blew on it, and it became Adam. That's going to be really important, important when we get to the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness because he restored that. We have the breath of God again. The animals didn't get this personal identity. You have the breath of God in you and the blessings of God over you. The only difference between you and a pile of dust is the breath of God. A couple of months ago, Paulson had given us a great message on the breath of God. But God made man and then put, he got made man in his image and then put his breath in him, right? Genesis 2.15. <coughs> The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to care for it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Now, God puts a limit on the authority to the rule of mankind, and we humans hate limits. Right? Everything about our life is to try to live without limits. We all have cell phones with unlimited plans and internet with unlimited plans and all this stuff, right? But this limit was that there was one tree that he was not to eat from. But catch this, as the gardener, he must still tend to the tree, just not eat from it. God had not yet created woman, so this command goes to Adam solely. This is important to remember. Adam had an obligation here. Genesis 2.18. The Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what, we, what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was his name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and the beasts of the field, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So God now sees it's not good for man to be alone, and he needs a, comp a companion and helper. <clears throat> Adam then uses his authority that God gave him to name all of the animals. This is Adam's first use of his authority. Calling things what they are. That's part of our authority, and I talk about this all the time. We get to call things that are not as though they were. That's what Adam did. We get to call things that are not as though they were. Be healthy. Be healed. Be redeemed. But in this process, there was no suitable helper found for Adam. Genesis 2.1 So the Lord God caused man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and br he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. So God creates woman from Adam. And Adam uses his authority and names her woman, and then later Eve. And the Hebrew word for woman can also mean wife or female. It is important to note that God made male and female. His intentions for their creation were perfect. Mm -hmm. 
God took some Arama, blew on it, it became Aram, and then he split Aram and became Aram and woman. I'm pretty sure God doesn't make mistakes. Verse 24 in here says, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and will be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. Here we see the birth of marriage. Obviously, previous to this, there had been no marriage. There were no other mothers or fathers. This is God's statement about what marriage will be. This is not a man-ordained act. This is a God-ordained covenant. In ancient times, they held marriage as sacred as the sacraments of communion and baptism. And I think the Catholic Church still does. And I believe it should be. Marriage should be as sacred as baptism and communion. Because it was created by God in the beginning of time as part of the identity of mankind and our covenant relationship with him. Marriage was straight from the heart of God, and that's important to remember. Then there's also the promise here of one flesh. This is not something that we can do on our own. Therefore, Satan wants to attack here because there is promise. Satan will attack anything that has promise attached to it. This is also where covenant is involved in. Satan loves to attack covenant. It's hard for us to understand covenant. I want to describe of covenant for a minute and how it relates to marriage, okay? So covenant, to put it in some real earthly secular terms, covenant can be seen that God comes to a particular human being and says, I want you to give me a million dollars. But I know that you don't have a million dollars, so here's a million dollars, just hand it back to me. <laughs> That's covenant. God does everything and we just say yes. God wants us to live a perfect and beautiful, washed, clean, redeemed life. But we can't do that. So God says, okay, here's my son Jesus. He died on the cross. He took care of your sins. Now just say yes and give it back to me. So we get to live a washed, clean, redeemed, perfect life because we said yes to what Jesus did on the cross. That's covenant, right? Now here's marriage. God says, I want to take two fallible people, a man and a woman. I want you to live together in the same household as one flesh. And I want you to have perfect unity and harmony at all times. Has anyone ever been married before? No, that's not possible. <laughs> so God says, I want you to live together with this woman. I want you to have perfect unity and, and harmony at all times. But I know you can't do that. So I'm going to stick myself in the middle right between you two. So God is right between husband and wife at all times. That's how marriage works. That's covenant. We can't do marriage on our own without his covenant participation in it, okay? That's what the devil is attacking. Because the devil understands if he can get rid of God from the covenant part of this marriage thing, the whole world and all of humanity falls apart. Do you see that? We're probably halfway there, aren't we? God asks something of us that we can't do, and then he does it for us. That's covenant. Verse 25. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. There was no shame in the relationship between Adam and Eve, which means there was no guilt and there was no embarrassment. They had perfect unity and oneness. Being naked was all they knew. It was normal and natural. Feeling shameful or embarrassed about nakedness, then, is demonic. Y'all all right? Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say you may not eat from the tree that was in the middle of the garden, and that you must not touch it or you will die. You will surely not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. This verse starts by telling us that Satan was more crafty than any of the other animals created. I want to come back to that because that's really important to remember. But for the moment, we need to remember that he is the most deceiving thing that we'll face. Satan is more crafty than any other created thing. Right? But it also says that he was created by God so that we know Satan is created. 
and we know that God gave us authority over all of his creation, you follow me? Yeah. Guess what? We're supposed to have authority over Satan. But now the attacks begin. We have seen the promise, and now we begin to see the attacks. He attacks because of promise, he attacks because of blessing, and he attacks because of covenant. Because we have so much personal promise and blessing from God, the enemy will attack our personal identity just to get at marriage, because marriage is so sacred. We have the image of God, we have the breath of God, we have the authority of God, we have the blessings of God, and we have the promise of fruitfulness from God. All of these attacks, and then the enemy comes and attacks all of that stuff, but that attack, that attack is getting at marriage. Because it is so central to what God has set up here. And oftentimes, he is getting us, the enemy is getting us to believe that we have less than the fullness of God's promises. And that will eventually lead us to deny God or get angry with him, and that Gallup poll that I mentioned proves it. Half the world doesn't even believe in Satan anymore. So he's been effective at what he told us that he was going to do. I got an interesting analogy I want to share with you on that. My son-in-law, Nick, is sitting over here. And he is a fantastic player of the game Exploding Kittens. And you will sit down at the table and he'll go, well, this is the strategy that I'm going to use. And he'll lay out his strategy. And you're thinking, that's never going to work. And then you play the game with him, and he slaughters you using the strategy he told you he was going to use. That's what the devil did. The devil's like, this is what I'm going to do, and then he did it, and he got away with it. Now, I'm not implying that you're anything like the devil, but... The first thing he says, the first thing that Satan says is he questions the goodness of God. You know, I talk all the time, the enemy, the devil only has two lies, right? Is God good? And who do you think you are? Right? So here in the Garden of Eden, Satan comes into it and says, Eve, is God really good? I think God is holding out on you. I think you should be eating that tree. God's not good. You shouldn't trust God. Right? So he begins to trust the goodness of God. And then his second attack, so Adam, the first man, and then there's Jesus, which is the second Adam. So that when Jesus is tempted in the wilderness, Satan comes to Jesus in the wilderness and says, Who do you think you are? Are you really the Son of God? Satan only has two lives. He only has two attacks. Is God good? And who do you think you are? Right? Now, if you go to the store to buy cookies at Walmart, there might be a thousand different varieties of cookies. Satan can package these two lies a thousand different ways. But if you really, I've challenged people this, and no one's ever come up with a lie outside of these two. God only has two lies. Satan only has two lies. Is God good, and who do you think you are? He's told us his strategy, and yet we still fall for it. So the first thing that Satan does, he attacks the, and questions the goodness of God. Then he also attacks authority. He goes behind Adam's back. Adam was the keeper of the garden, and Adam had been given authority over all of this. God had given Adam the command not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The buck was supposed to stop with Adam, but Satan goes behind his back to Eve to attack Adam's authority. You see that? This can manifest itself in a lot of different ways. It could work out as being super passive or super dictator-like. Adam went passive and didn't do anything. We must fight the real enemy and, and, and fight it in the right way. So Adam has been given all this authority. and He is supposed to be leading Eve in this thing. And so Adam, or the devil goes behind Adam's back and says, Hey Eve, you think he really has authority? Hey, you think you could really tell you not to eat from that tree? I believe the devil also was leading Eve into jealousy. Trying to convince her to be jealous of the authority that Adam had. The serpent is trying to convince Eve that she deserves something that was not given to her. Do you see that? God gives the authority to Adam... And then the devil's like, but Eve, Eve, don't you want that? Don't you want that authority? Don't you want to have that? 
He's undermining Adam's authority by getting Eve jealous for what wasn't given to her. <clears throat> and what did Adam do? Nothing. All right, Genesis 3.8. <clears throat> What is with my voice today? Oh, the devil? <laughs> <laughs> then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God <clears throat> called the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. <coughs> I want to cover verse 12 here separately and then I'm going to try to capture this whole, this whole section. <clears throat> the greatest sin in this section is not that Eve ate the fruit, but that Adam passed the blame. The man said, the woman you put here, she gave me some fruit and I ate it. This was utter failure on terms of Adam's leadership and authority. Hardline Christians who want to hold women down often point to Eve's failure. Yet in my mind, this is all on Adam. Adam set Eve up to fail. With authority comes responsibility and leadership, and Adam failed at both. I wish I could give you examples in that, but I better not because I don't have permission to share those stories. But <clears throat> we've been given authority and, and leadership. We've got to be able to use that in the right way. Oftentimes, if I see somebody around me, even someone in the church that's a volunteer, and they didn't do something right or they're failing in some way, I'll tell them, I said, that's actually my fault because I didn't lead you well in that. Do you see the difference? One holds authority, one releases authority. If I do what Adam did and I said, well, it was her fault, I've just given up all my authority. But if I say that's my fault because I didn't lead you well, I retained my authority. Do you see that? <clears throat> I'll kind of into the whole section here. To drive a wedge between Adam and Eve, God attacks this covenant relationship. By coming between Adam and Eve and God, he can destroy the marriage covenant, and then marriage doesn't work, right? So there's, there's man, there's woman, and there's God's in between to make marriage work. And then Adam, or the devil, kind of goes around Eve's back and goes over to Adam and Eve. And he's, he's, he's suffering, he's dividing them to take God out of that covenant role of being in the middle. <clears throat> Here is a quote from scholar Anthony Hokema. He wrote a book called Created in His Image. It's a brilliant book about being created in the image of God. He says this, Shame has now revealed itself in fear. Adam was afraid of God. He also evaded the real issues. He should have said, I was afraid because I sinned. But instead he said, I was afraid because I was naked. Do you see the difference? In other words, shame manifests itself as fear. That's like, well, that's your fault. You did it wrong versus, I'm sorry, I didn't lead you well in that. One gives up authority, one retains authority. If I feel shame or embarrassment that I don't function within the marriage relationship in a healthy way, I will not only try to hide from God, but I'll try to hide from my spouse. And that's exactly what the devil did to Adam and Eve. Now they need clothing, which means there is shame and nakedness and sex. And this was not from God, this was from the enemy. The enemy attacks nakedness and sex. He perverts it. He fills it with shame. He attacks it because it's part of the one flesh promise from God. In the garden, being naked was normal. So now seeing someone naked is perverted and sinful. Because of that, it now has great power, allure, and temptation, which means it's demonic. God never intended any of that stuff for nakedness and sex. That was to be the the one flesh promise of marriage. What tempts human beings to pornography is actually the fuel for shame, and which is ultimately separation from God. This is an attack on our being image, created in God's image. Nakedness was how God created us. Of course, passing blame and failing to live up to one's mistakes is also born here in this passage. From his position of authority, Adam was to share with Eve not to eat from the tree and to provide leadership. 
Using his authority, he could have also commanded the serpent to leave. Remember, God had given Adam authority over all of the created order, including Satan. When Satan enters the garden and goes to tempt Eve, Adam could have been like, hey, Satan, get out of here. Leave. Go. And he would have had the authority to do that. But now I want to show you something cool. The cross of Christ provides a pathway for us to take that authority back. Adam was given all authority over, over earth. And then because he didn't walk in it the way that God wanted, he blamed Eve, he lost all of his authority. Then when Jesus comes back and he walks in obedience, he recaptures that authority that Adam lost. So what Adam lost, Jesus regained. And then he shares that authority with us. So the authority that Adam had over all of creation has been restored to you and me. Do you believe it? Here, and here's how this can walk out in everyday ways. I'm way off my notes now, so good luck, people. But anyway. <laughs> when we think about health in our bodies, right? Remember, we were made from Adam, Adama. God took Adama, blew on it, and made Adam, right? So ultimately, our bodies are still made from the earth. And God gave authority to Adam over all of the earth. Then Adam lost that. Jesus got that back. So we have, re we, our, our authority over Adama has been restored, but we're made from Adama. So when our body is out of whack, we can speak to it in authority and command it to come back into alignment. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Right? Our authority to speak healing is rooted in the fact that Jesus restored the authority that was given to Adam. We lose, we want to wrap up healing all just into the New Testament context. But healing actually goes all the way back to Genesis when God gave Adam authority. Mm -hmm. All right, is that clear as mud? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Eve was at least honest in her confession. She said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Adam denied his sin and passed the blame to Eve, a sure way to lose authority. Through disobedience, Adam, Adam lost the authority. Through obedience, Christ won the authority back for all of us. And then he shared that authority with us at the end of Matthew. But the enemy has convinced us that, that he doesn't exist and that we don't have authority. As we look at all that ails our world today, it's rooted in the fact that the devil has convinced us he doesn't exist and that we no longer have authority. The attacks on marriage, gender, and identity are so effective, Satan is still using them. But we mistake them for political issues rather than spiritual issues. Rather than trying to fix things by voting in different people, we need to take up our authority. Yeah. You don't handle snakes with your hands, you step on them. <laughs> Seriously, we look at the ails of our world and we go, oh, we, need to, we need to elect some new people. We've been given authority and it's been restored to us by Jesus. We can fix what ails our world through authority and stop falling for his sneaky attacks. Our culture has tried to normalize what the devil does. Yeah. Anyway, all right, let me wrap it up. I promise we'd be done before lunch. So how do, we, how do we deal with all this stuff? First, we need to be aware. We just need to be aware that he is attacking and that ultimately what Satan is trying to attack is marriage. Again, so much that you could name a problem in our world right now and it's ultimately the way the devil is trying to attack marriage. But we can't wait around until there's already visible consequences. Remember the three stages. I'm not there. Intimidation. Deal, deal making, right? Here's how we should pray. Lord, open our eyes to all the schemes of the devil. Lord, will you please reveal truth and open eyes? And what I hear people is praying is, oh God, give us new government. Give us new politicians. Give us new systems. God, give us open eyes to see how the enemy is attacking us. Reveal truth and open eyes to that truth and remind people that we have authority. We also need to, in this being aware, we need to remember that God is good and God is good at all that he does. Because as soon as we begin to question the goodness of God, 
we're under attack, right? We always have to be looking for the backdoor attacks of the enemy because he loves to sneak do the end around and come around and just hit us somewhere where we weren't expecting, right? Satan loves to con confuse the roles in marriage. We're equal in partnership, but different in tasks. Right? We're equal in partnership, but different in tasks. But the enemy loves to confuse that. Hey, Eve, aren't you a little jealous that Adam's got this authority that you don't have? The second thing we need to do is put Jesus over all of it. Apply the blood of Jesus to any area of shame or guilt. Shame and guilt are the fuel for sin. As soon as you feel shame and guilt, you're under the attack of the enemy. Because shame and guilt do not come from God. So apply the blood of Jesus to it. Apply the blood of Jesus over your home and your marriage. So you protect it from any attacks even coming. Take ownership of the promises and the blessings. <clears throat> in Psalm 23, it says, God prepares the table before me in the presence of my enemies. So God has taken all of these blessings, laid out a big banquet table, and he did it right in front of the devil. And here's the thing. The devil can't touch what's on your table unless you let him. So claim ownership of your blessing. That's mine, devil. Don't touch it. A lot of us need to learn that language. That's mine, devil. Don't touch it. Don't be passive either. But make sure you fight the right fight. Number four, take ownership of your sin. Be quick to confess and quick to repent. Something Adam didn't do. Fight back with the word. If the enemy says you are unworthy, say thank you, Jesus, that I am simply worthy because I bear your image. Yeah. If the devil tells you you don't have enough, remind him that I have more than enough because I have all of God's blessings. If the enemy tells you your life doesn't matter, remind him that I have the breath of God in me and I have the same spirit in me that raised Christ from the dead. Yeah. Seriously, if the devil comes to torment you, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is in me. Who are you talking to? Yeah. <clears throat> if he tries to put shame on you, own the sin, not the shame. If he tries to do an end around on your authority, remind him of Luke 10, 19. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Seriously, when the devil tries to question your authority, no, I have all authority and you can't touch it. The more the devil, the devil attacks you, the more you draw near to God and to your spouse. Because what he wants you to do is to quit both. And then finally, let love win. The enemy can't compete with this. You know, usually I like to have my messages really heavily based on application. There's not much application. I'm, I hate to use this term, but I'm trying to raise awareness that what's going on in our world is actually demonic attacks from the devil going all the way back to Genesis. But we need to learn to recognize it and then walk in authority. Amen? Amen. All right, I'll invite worship team back up.